Today we're going to be looking at the Commodore 128D. Now I did originally have this planned as a single video just looking at the power supply and the capacitors on the power supply and also the disk drive but that video ended up being very long so I'm actually going to split this up into two videos. So today we're just going to be checking out the power supply and the capacitors and I do say capacitors a lot in this video, I don't know how many times. Um, but if you're interested in knowing more about power supplies and specifically capacitors, um, stick around, we'll be checking that out. And uh, if you wanna know more about disk drives, um, definitely check out the next video that's gonna come out because that will go heavily into aligning a 1571 disk drive and bump stops and zero track detectors and all that kind of stuff. So um, today's just the power supply and um, yeah, with that said, let's get into it. Hi everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel. This here is a Commodore 128D. It is one of the CR or cost reduced versions. So it does have the metal case. Now I did look at one of these on the channel in the past. This isn't the same one. Uh, this one's actually having some issues with the floppy drive. So we're gonna take a look at that in a minute. But before we do that, I wanna have a look at the power supply in this thing. Now it is a different power supply from the other DCR that I looked at in the past. This one seems to have a lot more, how should we say, robust looking power supply. The other one had a very cheap and it turned out to be a fairly nasty power supply that I ended up replacing entirely. So let's crack this open. We'll have a look at the power supply and I'll talk about some of the issues that I found with it. So one of the first things that stood out when looking at this power supply was it was very different to the previous one that I worked on. Uh, the power supply in that one just had a single transformer and then there was sort of a half switch mode, half linear power supply on the other side. This one actually has a proper switch mode power supply and also a linear, well, just an AC transformer really, just to supply the AC for the actual main board. So this one does look a lot more robust, but the thing that really stands out is the brown goo on top of the capacitors and some of it around the base of the capacitors. Now this does appear to just be uh, glue that they've used to um, secure the capacitors because it is just a single sided board. But in some areas that goo was actually starting to corrode some of the traces, well at least some of the jumper wires that were on top of the board. So it was worth pulling all these capacitors out and pretty much replacing them. First of all, to make sure that goo hadn't made it underneath the capacitors where you couldn't see them and was potentially corroding the actual capacitor leads or maybe the capacitor case. And second of all, you know, they're a fairly, by the looks of it, cheap capacitors in a fairly old power supply. So it was worth taking them all off and replacing them. Now I did also take some measurements of the capacitors that were in the board and also the ones that I was replacing them with just so I could put all that in a spreadsheet and compare some of the values. Now I took the capacitance measurement and also the dissipation factor uh, reading at 120 hertz. So for the most part, most of the capacitors that were in there seemed to test fine. A couple of them like the 2200 microfarad ones did have a fairly high dissipation factor, but as these capacitors are Nikon branded, I cannot actually find the data sheets. So I don't know what they're supposed to read and what the maximum dissipation factor is uh, that these are supposed to have. So I don't really know if these capacitors are completely good or bad, but yeah, those 2200 microfarad ones at least don't look the best. Now, if we compare that to the capacitors that I installed in here, things look a lot better, except for one of them, uh, which was a Panasonic 4700 microfarad. Now, the capacitors actually came from the owner of this machine. They'd already purchased the capacitors, and for the most part, they did a good job. The Panasonic, I expected to be okay, but as it turns out, the D value on that is already very close to the manufacturer's maximum rating. So I didn't end up using the Panasonic one. I actually put a Rubicon one in there, which uh, reads a lot better. It is actually a 25 volt one, and the original one was only a 10 volt one. 
but even with that the um the capacitance is pretty much spot on and the d value is quite good as well so i was more than happy to replace it with the 25 volt one i don't see any issue there the other thing i was sure to do was make sure i got a good solder joint on these capacitors because these are fairly bulky capacitors and it's only a single sided board there's no through hole plating so all the stress of the weight of those capacitors or any vibrations that would move them back and forth all gets put on that one solder joint and you need to have a good clean solder joint and also the legs of the components also should be cleaned as well i made extra sure that all these solder joints were good clean shiny no pits or holes or anything in them and i'm using 6337 solder so it doesn't have a plastic uh, transition point it pretty much goes from a solid to a liquid and back again so um yeah that's just a tip if you're doing work with a single-sided board especially ones with yeah fairly bulky components on them make sure you have good solder joints that are clean shiny and if you can pick up some 6337 solder uh, i use the kester brand um, and it's just a rosin core 6337 leaded solder. All the capacitors are now back in the board and everything's pretty much reinstalled. And I've just noticed I've left a screw not fully done up. Yes, I did actually have to pull out the entire main board uh, because the uh, cartridge slash expansion port had some legs clipped off it at some point and then replaced, but it looked pretty rough. So the owner asked if I could do a better job. So I, I think I achieved that. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that work. So let's go with that. Now, the other thing worth noting is this machine did have a fan installed. I will actually reinstall this, but um, you'll notice that if you've ever seen a 128D case, it does actually have the cutout for the fan on the back but I don't think they're normally installed from the factory. So I guess this was a, a aftermarket job and judging by the look of it, almost certainly. In fact, the leads when I was recapping this thing uh, were just soldered onto part of the main board and they actually broke off. And there was a little bit of corrosion where they'd had the glue around the main board as well. So um, it was kind of good that they broke off because that got me to look at the actual connections and tidy them up a little bit too. So um, we'll reconnect the fan in a second. I haven't actually powered this machine on yet, so I don't even know if it's gonna work, but I'm pretty sure I've got everything right here. So um, let's find out. That all sounds normal. We're not seeing any capacitors bulging or anything. Yeah. Right, the fan. Now, I don't know where I'm gonna wire this back up to. All right, sorry about the random pause. The overhead camera overheated and shut down. Funny how it was happy to film three hours of me stuffing around replacing capacitors and checking values and fixing cartridge ports, but once I actually go to film something that is of interest, it shuts off. Anyway, ended up sticking little pin headers on the board itself and then sticking little connectors on the wires. So now we should be able to plug these two in here. I think I've got that the right way around. The blue wire is quite short, so I did angle the other one just in case I need to get the blue wire to there, but this should still work. And the fan is blowing air out, and now we can disconnect it and work on the disk drive in silence. If you've seen the video I did on my Commodore 128, that's the plastic version with a built-in fan in the power supply and all of them, uh, you'll know how much effort I went to to make that a cooler running machine and get rid of the fan in that because I'm just not a huge fan of fans. All right, so as I mentioned, today is just gonna be the power supply, even though I mentioned the disk drive in the video, but uh, continuity errors, 
Um, so yeah, next video will be fully on the disk drive. And uh, yeah, until then, a massive thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon and YouTube memberships. Uh, if you want to do the same, check out the links below. But even if you want to help the channel, just a like, subscribe, leave a comment. Uh, that'd be greatly appreciated. I will catch you in the next one with the disk drive.